Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast, where we come to you every Tuesday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA, to share with you passages in the New Testament regarding the ultimate question we all must ask and answer, and that is, what must I do to be saved? We look at these passages in detail, we ask questions of these passages, and we answer these questions from the passages themselves because the Bible is self-interpreting, speaks for itself, and we must hear the words it has to say because this is why Jesus is always continually saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The same message God gave Ezekiel in the long ago and this is the challenge of our times will we have the ears to hear the words of salvation or will we not and so I welcome you to this newest addition to calling on the name of the Lord podcast I come to you from the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina, and my name is Russ McCullough. Last time we examined a passage in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 verses 18 through 20. I'd like to read those for you again uh, in way of review, and then we'll answer the questions we asked last time regarding this passage. And hopefully you wrote these questions down and went to your Bible as the Bereans did and searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were so because the answers are in the passage. Uh, They are from revelation and not speculation. We here at the Archdale Church of Christ and Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast have it as our solemn rule of thumb to neither add to nor take away from the Word of God. For it is neither our right, our privilege, and we have no such permission to do so. And if we were to presume to add or take away, we would be in rebellion to God himself. And so we take these matters very seriously, as I know you do as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's a fantastic passage. And we would like uh, you also to note in the margin of your Bible, uh, next to these verses, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is where Jesus goes to his home synagogue in Nazareth and articulates the message or the meaning or the mission of his coming. And that is to set at liberty those who are enslaved to sin. And so we noted last time and we'll note again, and you can also put this in the margin of your Bible in Luke 4 and also 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, And that is the three R's of the mission of Christ. The three R's of the gospel, if you please. And that is reconciliation, restoration, and remission. Remission. Remission of sins. And we noted then, and we'll note again, that the word that's translated liberty in Luke 4 is 
translated remission, same word, in Acts 2.38. The remission of sins in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is the same word that Jesus says in Luke 4 as liberty. Liberty from sin is remission from sins. Remission of sins comes only only and exclusively as we have articulated by calling on the name of the Lord and we know that calling on the name of the Lord is synonymous with water baptism that we learn this from Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 so all these things are linked together and so we must have a broad understanding of what the scripture says because it says it plainly it's our mission to accept it Believe it and obey it and teach others to do so. And that's what we're doing now. So we want to answer the questions we posed last time when we looked at this passage. Uh, number one, what does, quote, all this, end quote, refer to? That's in uh, verse um, 18. All this is from God. And that is he's speaking of, in the previous verses, that we no longer regard Christ in human terms because he is no longer just human yes he did come in a human body and he died in a human body but he was raised in a new eternal spiritual body uh, ascended back to heaven and now reigns on the right hand of God this is how we are to regard him now regard him as the king of the universe and the Savior of all mankind. This is what all this refers to in verse 18. Number two, according to verse 18, what uh, two things uh, has Christ done for us? Number one, he's reconciled himself to us, and we to him uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we've been reconciled through our baptism, restored to God through our baptism. Hello, Carol. Uh, it's good to see you here today. We are excited to know that Christ has reconciled us to himself. And number two, he's given us something, the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, the very thing that saved us, he has given to us to give to others. And Paul's been talking about this in this long passage that we've been dealing with. It goes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, all the way through 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. And that is this ministry of reconciliation. Uh, it is the gospel. It is, as Paul articulates in chapter 5, as the knowledge of of the light of the glory of God expressed in the face of Jesus Christ that's the gospel and he's given to us in our jars of clay in our human frail bodies we are the receptacles and the conduits of the gospel he's poured this light into us then then we are to pour it out for others that's the essence of the mission of a Christian. The Christian's mission is a ministry of reconciliation. It is We are proclaimers of the gospel. We are proclaimers of liberty. We are proclaimers of remission of sins. Whether or not a person realizes it or not, their greatest need in life is the remission of their sins. For without it, one cannot spend eternity with God and instead will spend eternity with Satan. What a horrible fate. We must warn people every time we can that there is remission of sins. And that is why we encourage you, uh, wherever you are and whoever you are, uh, whether you're viewing from Charlotte or somewhere else, uh, to note uh, your presence in the comment section. And most importantly, not only to note your presence in the comment section, but to share these videos with your own timeline on Facebook and other social media platforms. Link these messages 
uh, so others can hear the words of salvation. And you will then fulfill the Great Commission to your great honor in eternity. Uh, there's no greater happiness in eternity than meeting someone with whom you shared the words of liberty, the words of remission, the words of salvation, the words of reconciliation and restoration. This is, this is our goal, to not only go to heaven, but to bring others with us. And because of technology, it is so easy to share the gospel. Today, more easy than it's ever been. As we have said, and we'll say again right now, you just pick up your, uh, your mouse, a few clicks, and you've shared the gospel with many people. Many people you may not ever see or meet or hear from. But yet, the word has gone forth. And God promises that his word will not return to him void or empty. And so uh, it is a great honor and privilege to come to you with these words of reconciliation, restoration, and remission. Uh, so back to our questions. Uh, number three, in Christ, what does God not count against us? Our trespasses, our sins. If we are in Christ, all the sins we've committed are wiped away. They're gone. They're forgotten. Uh, this is the great thing about Salvation, one of the great things is that everyone, no matter how despicable one might be, hey, Casey, it's good to see you. Uh, walking and listening, that's great. Uh, this is so fantastic that no matter who we are, what we've done, uh, when we uh, repent of those sins, all of them, and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins, all of them, uh, they are forgiven. They are remitted. We are reconciled to God once more. We are restored to God once more. And we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit of God himself living in us. And at that moment in time, at our baptism, Christ himself, God himself, adds us to the church. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, those who will spend eternity with him in eternity if we remain faithful. And that is, of course, the challenge of our lives to remain faithful. But who we used to be is wiped out, gone forever, forgotten by God. And so it doesn't matter what you've done in your past, it can be forgiven. And ongoing, as John the Apostle tells us in his uh, first epistle, that uh, as long as we confess our sins to God, uh, he is just and righteous to forgive us all of our iniquities, ongoing, so we can live continuously in liberty and live in continuous remission and live in continuous reconciliation and live in continuous restoration to God. If we remain faithful, do as he instructs and confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our iniquities. And so these are great promises, and we cannot be held accountable for things that we did in the past if we obey God and are reconciled to him. And it is a, a dastardly false doctrine to hold sins against one whose sins have been remitted. They're gone, they're forgiven by God, and who are we? to hold someone accountable for sins that have been forgiven by God himself. And so we must understand that even though the consequences of our sins may follow us all our lives as they did David the king, uh, we are at liberty in Christ. And on that last day, we will hear those words from Christ. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. And we long to hear those words. The ultimate reward of reconciliation. This ministry that we've been given. Uh, question number four. To what does he 
entrust. What does he entrust with us? The most valuable thing on earth. And it is, as he says in verse 19, the message of reconciliation, the gospel. He's given it to us. Once we've become a Christian ourselves, he gives us the ultimate treasure, the words, the message of reconciliation. It is a great honor and a greater responsibility. Again, you can fulfill that responsibility right now by simply sharing this message on your timeline. It is not difficult. Let us know that you have in the comment section. Okay, number five, we are what? Quote, therefore, end quote. We are ambassadors for Christ. We have been appointed the ambassador of Christ to the whole world. You know, usually ambassadors are limited to one country. Uh, if you're, example, given the honor of becoming the ambassador of the United States to the, the nation of Great Britain, to the court of St. James, uh, this is a great honor. But you are our ambassador only to the English. You're not an ambassador to the French or anyone else. Exclusively and only to the English. But with Christ, we are ambassadors wherever we go. Uh, you and I are ambassadors for Christ, not only to England, but to every other country in the world. And you say, well, I, I, I've, I've never leaving my, live, <laughs> leaved, <laughs> The words won't come today. Uh, I haven't left my hometown in 30 years. Uh, how can I take the gospel to all over the world? Well, here it is. This thing we call the Internet. Right now, you can become ambassador to any country you wish. Immediately by sharing this to your timeline and making sure someone in whatever country you wish uh, receives it. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a wonderful blessing that we have. Uh, let us know where you are sending this message of reconciliation. Uh, we'll be excited to hear about it and pray for the success of that message uh, as it goes out. Um, finally, number six, we ask, all are to be what? Therefore, verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you there, uh, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Reconciliation starts at our baptism, and it's a continuous process. We continuously are reconciled to God when we are obedient to his will. And so uh, it is a wonderful thing to be reconciled and restored and have our sins remitted through Jesus Christ. So that is uh, from last time, those questions. And today we want to review uh, what uh, Paul says then from verse 21 of chapter 5 through verse 2 of chapter 6. Uh, again, these chapter and verse designations were not in the original text. This is all one continuous dialogue when Paul wrote it. Uh, and the scripture says this. For our sake, he made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God working together with him. Then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. 
Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is an appeal to Christians, specifically the Corinthian Christians, the Church of Christ in Corinth. Uh, but the Holy Spirit inspired this word to be written down and shared with everyone subsequently. That's why it's in our New Testament. The Holy Spirit preserved it through the ages. And we might not think much about that, but uh, to tell you the truth, uh, statistically, 0% of things that were written down in the first century uh, are still in our possession. Statistically, 100% of all the things that were written down uh, are lost. But there are a few things remain, very few. And the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ not only is preserved, 100% of it is preserved. This is a miracle that we have, this thing we call the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so it is incumbent upon us to heed these words because they were written to the Corinthians, but they were also written to every Christian who would ever live from then on. And the Holy Spirit has preserved his word miraculously and given it to us. People say, well, I, I, I wish there were miracles today. There are miracles today. Open up your New Testament. You'll see a miracle right there that this book in its entirety has been preserved by the Holy Spirit for 2,000 years. Think about it. Okay, we want to uh, just make a few observations of the passage and then we'll, uh, we'll pose some questions that we'll answer tomorrow from the text. So, uh, for our sake, your sake, my sake, every Christian's sake, God made Christ to be sin, even though he knew no sin. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he was sinless. And yet, he took on the mantle of our sins, and he became sin himself when he was sacrificed on the cross. The sins of all mankind, every person, from Adam the first man to whoever the last person who was born on earth, whoever that might be, and whenever that might be, the sins of all these people, every one of them, your sins, my sins, everyone else's sins, were put on Christ while he hung on the cross. And this is why God had to turn his back upon Christ momentarily. Because at that moment in time when God looked at Christ, he didn't see his beloved son. Instead, he saw all the sins of all humans for all time and he had to turn his back and Christ bore it alone for those few minutes as he passed from physical life to physical death and he did that for us he took on our sins and our punishment and sacrificed himself for us. It is no great, uh, it is such a great thing. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened in all of eternal history, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And do not forget that. When you're reading your history, whatever kind of history you're talking about, it's foolishness and nonsense compared to the greatest historical event in all of cosmic history, and that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Take that to the bank. It's the greatest event that ever happened or ever will happen. And why did God do this? Why did Christ do this? 
It's so, he says, in the text that we, in him, in Christ, might become the righteousness of God. You remember when Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, that you will in no wise inherit the kingdom of heaven? And people say, well, how, who, could, who could be saved? Well, we can become righteous, but only if we clothe ourselves in the righteousness of Christ. And the only way that we can do that is to be, as Paul says here, in him. In him. So we have to ask ourselves the question, dear viewer, how does one get into Christ? It's the ultimate question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to get into Christ in order to clothe myself in the righteousness of Christ that I have none of in and of myself? Galatians chapter 3. I want you to turn to Galatians 3 and mark this in your Bibles because this passage tells us precisely how to get into Christ so that we can put on his righteousness and have the righteousness of God to protect us. Beginning with verse 23, uh, mark this in your Bibles, Galatians 3, 23 beginning. Now that when before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ, in Christ Jesus, verse 25, or 26 rather, for in Christ Jesus you are, present tense, all, all persons in Christ are sons of God, how? Through faith. For as many of you, as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins renders the gift of the Holy Spirit. It renders membership in the church of Christ, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And here, Right here, it places us into Christ, wherein is all righteousness, which we put on ourselves through Christ. We cannot emphasize enough the urgent importance of being in Christ. And there's only one way to get into Christ. There's not two ways, ten ways, a hundred ways. There's just one way. If you want to be in Christ, you have to be baptized into him. No other way. The Bible is so very clear on this. Okay, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The thought continues in chapter 6, verse 1. It's a continuous thought. It's a sad thing that the person that made these chapter designations, put it where it is, because it's not the right place. Uh, working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. This is um, an important point that Paul makes to the Corinthians and to us that uh, we are not ministers of reconciliation caring about the message of reconciliation and going about being ambassadors for Christ by ourselves we have a cosmic partner which is God himself we work together with God 
for the sake of the gospel, caring about this ministry, this message of reconciliation. God is our partner. Now that's a sobering thought, but it should be a comforting thought that when we go about sharing the message of reconciliation, God is working with us. He's our partner. He can make things happen. You and I, being human, can't make anything happen. Paul makes this clear that we're simply conduits, jars of clay, in which is poured the light of God. But God, being our partner, and the author of our salvation, can make things happen. If you're going to have a partner, make sure you have a partner who can make things happen that you can't make happen yourself. God is the ultimate partner, and every time we share the message of reconciliation, every time we share the gospel, every time we tell people that there is remission of sins, God is our partner. We're working together with him. We're not doing this by ourselves. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What is he speaking of here? This is a very sobering point that we must embrace. And that is, please, Christian friend, do not receive the message of reconciliation and be reconciled to God by yourself. Because if you receive this message and receive this remission and receive this restoration and then withhold that message to others, what does Paul say here? You will have received the message in vain. The message is to be received in order to be shared. And if we don't share the message of reconciliation, we may find out that we received it in vain. Because it was Jesus who said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it was Jesus who said, To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. A person uh, is not going to ever believe if we don't share the message. Now, they may reject it. That is on them. But if we share it, then we have fulfilled our obligation to God and to Christ. So, again, not to be redundant, but I guess I am being redundant. Step up to the plate. Swing the bat of obedience. Strike the ball of reconciliation and send it out of the park. By simply sharing this message and others with those on your timeline, it could not be more simple. And it will be a great reward for you should you do so. Please, do not receive the grace of God in vain. And then he says, why? It's because in a favorable time, God listened to who? To you. When you called upon the name of the Lord for salvation in your repentance and your baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, he listened. And he remitted those sins in that watery grave. Because in your day of salvation, he helped us. Now it's our turn to help someone else. And if we don't, we may just find that we received this message 
in vain. And then he finally says, the urgency of this is right now. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to do this. Share this message of reconciliation with everyone you can on your timeline. It is simple. I challenge you to do it. Because you will understand that you have fulfilled today, today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today, today being the day of salvation, you have fulfilled the Great Commission by sharing the message of reconciliation with as many people as you can. Remember this every day. So, now, we've come to that uh, point in time where we want to construct our questions for tomorrow. And uh, we like to do this together. Um, question number one. For whose sake for whose sake did he which is God make Christ sin for whose sake did he which is God make Christ sin that's question number one uh, question number two. How many sins did Christ commit? How many sins did Christ commit? Number three. How does one get into Christ? How does one get into Christ? Number four. How can we become the righteousness of God. How can we become the righteousness of God? Uh, question uh, number five. With whom do we work together. Number six. What does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain. Number seven. What did God do for you Per verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2. Number 8. When is the favorable 
time to share the message of reconciliation. So there you have it. Those are our questions we'll answer for tomorrow. In the meantime, open your Bibles, answer the questions from the text, and we will review those answers tomorrow, Lord willing, at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time USA here on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast. Until then, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.